Sam's Rosada has been living in this hospital room at the National Institutes of Health for two weeks. Do you have like wearables on, like tracking everything? Yes, so I do have a couple of these sensors. He's not sick. He's a participant in a clinical trial, one of the first of its kind, measuring his movement, his blood, his gut microbiome, even the air he breathes, all to try to better understand how our health is affected by ultra-processed foods. Oh, I think your food's coming in. We saw the kind of food he got. It had eggs and spinach and yogurt. But we don't know. That could be processed. It could be unprocessed. Um, that's part of the trial. Ultra-processed foods contain additives and ingredients you wouldn't find in your own kitchen. They were shown in the previous NIH study to drive overeating and weight gain, according to researcher Dr. Kevin Hall. Are ultra-processed foods just junk foods? What we often think of as junk foods probably captures a big chunk of the ultra-processed foods uh, kind of category. But there's a lot of things that people would be surprised that are in the ultra-processed foods category and, you know, could potentially be healthy for you. So things like whole grain breads that you might buy from the supermarket. Most of those are considered ultra-processed because of some of the additives and preservatives that are in there as well as how they're manufactured. There's a lot of debate about whether or not all ultra-processed foods uh, are bad for you. And that's what this trial is trying to find out. What are the mechanisms? What is it about this category of foods that is driving people to overconsume calories? Dr. Hall's team has two ideas about what might be causing people to overeat some ultra-processed foods. Their energy density, or how many calories are in each gram of food, and their hyperpalatability, when foods contain just the right combinations of salt, sugar, fat, and carbs to make us not want to stop eating them. This is where they prepare all of the food. And they don't just prepare it, they weigh it before it goes up and when it comes back after the participant has eaten. Each day, participants in the trial are offered a total of 6,000 calories, and researchers measure how much they choose to eat. The trial is a month long, and each week has a different diet, minimally processed or different kinds of ultra-processed. Sam was in an ultra-processed week during our visit, but one with foods Dr. Hall doesn't expect will drive him to overeat. How is that ultra-processed? It's all based on the ingredients. So the eggs that we used in that omelet, the egg whites were a liquid egg product, so it has ingredients in it that make it ultra-processed. It's not just egg. So our yogurts, the pancake syrup that was in the yogurt, those all have ultra-processed ingredients in terms of um, added flavors, added sweeteners. The next day, Sam would switch to meals that were more energy dense and hyper palatable, the ones expected to lead to overeating. So you can see that these are all foods that um, they're ultra processed and you can see that the volume compared to this is quite different as well. Wow, that is really illustrative. I mean, just looking, you need two trays of food for this one and one tray of food for this next diet when you're getting the same number, you're offering at least the same number of calories. Correct, yes. Once a week, Sam spends a full day sealed in this metabolic chamber. Do you know what they're measuring in there? I think they're measuring how much O2 I consume and uh, how much carbon dioxide I release. The air he breathes in and out can tell researchers how many calories he's burning and whether they're coming from carbs or fat, all to help understand what ultra-processed foods really do to our bodies. By understanding how the food environment actually does shape our metabolic health, we hope to basically improve um, the food supply in the future. 